Thank you very much. That's uh, out outstanding. So next uh, presentation is from Pioneer in this uh, area of analyzing DTI data sets, uh, Susumu Mori from Johns Hopkins uh, University, who will present some of this latest work with DTI Studio software for image processing. Thank you. So today I would like to introduce uh, our software DTI Studio and recent development. Uh, first of all, our group doesn't have uh, much experience in TBI, so uh, my presentation is going to be more generic, and I hope uh, it's going to be useful for TBI. So if we look into DTI data, uh, I, I guess there's a uh, classical diffusion tensor imaging we've been talking about, as well as more uh, advanced non-tensor model. One thing I want to point out is that these two type of measurements uh, bifurcate early in the data acquisition phase because uh, for regular DTI, we usually use small B value and fewer directions. And uh, for, for, for the advanced uh, diffusion imaging, like diffusion spectral imaging, requires much higher B value and more uh, directions. So we, we really have to choose which one we, we want to do in the early phase of the study. And uh, DTI Studio has been historically uh, focusing on uh, this tensor model. And uh, our emphasis at the, uh, these, uh, in recent years is uh, more about downstream questions like uh, quality control, and quantification, uh, we, we have these new modules while uh, uh, those in green are only available as a uh, ideal code, MATLAB, uh, or command line code so that it hasn't been integrated in the DTI Studio yet. Now, uh, DTI Studio, this is just an interface uh, it was originally developed for ourselves uh, so that uh, we can get into every single step of diffusion tensor imaging and inspect what is exactly happening. Uh, so it's very visually intensive, and every step you have to click button. Uh, it, it is not very automated. Uh, we've been asked to automate it, but uh, the, the problem of automation has been uh, the many artifacts related to diffusion tensor imaging and uh, it has been very difficult to automate it. Uh, we all know that uh, the motion is a problem, more than one pixel doing five, 10 minutes of scan, eddy current distortion. This has been addressed by post-processing registration, and uh, within the box cell motion leads to drop, signal dropout and ghosting. Uh, we do slice rejection, pixel rejection, and I just wanna, uh, show some uh, examples. Uh, here is a typical uh, cases of uh, 32 diffusion orientation, and I, I just pick up uh, five of them. And this interface shows how uh, the brain moved uh, compared to uh, the, the data generated from the entire data set. And similar to fMRI study, it is relatively uh, straightforward to extract amount of rotation and amount of motion. Uh, this is one kind of uh, quality control you would be interested in. Sometimes you can see uh, the motion. This is five repeated measurement. Each has 30 uh, orientation measurement, and we can see the image gradually move upwards. This is not subject to... Uh, uh, physiological motion because uh, in five repeated scan, we see linear motion, very uh, reproducible. Uh, this must be related to uh, hardware such as gradient heating. Now, uh, we also uh, could uh, measure the amount of eddy current. This is uh, the XYZ, B0 eddy current uh, of one scanner over five years of period. Uh, and this is comparison between four different scanners. So this, this kind of co-registration tool and estimation of eddy current and motion has been around for more than 10 years. 
But uh, this is really the, the, the problem here. Uh, this shows a 32 diffusion uh, measurement, and this is uh, rotation and translation amount. Red it shows uh, the typical amount of the motion you would expect. And when we do when we extract these information, we have to do co-registration. And from the amount of registration, we estimate the amount of uh, rotation and translation. But this measurement assumes your post-processing registration works. And these are six of 30 diffusion-weighted image. And as you can see here, signal drop out, uh, odd and even number slices are misregistered. These motion cannot be corrected by post-processing analysis. So if you just do uh, blindly do the, the motion correction, eddy current correction without looking at the image, you wouldn't notice it. So th this is just a histogram of a data, data set and uh, amount of translation versus fitting quality. We can expect that uh, if the amount of motion is large, fitting quality of, uh, to the tensor degrade. After registration, post-mortem registration, we expect the fitting quality improves a lot. But you can see these outliers, and if you see outliers, surely enough, these are heavily motion-affected uh, data. So in addition to uh, do the post-processing uh, registration, you really have to watch this, uh, the, the Fit, tensor fitting quality uh, to estimate the data quality. As I said, another problem is signal dropout. Uh, this image is supposed to look like this. This image is supposed to look like this. Uh, if we subtract, we can clearly see which pixels uh, has artifact signal drop. Uh, the, the, the problem is if you don't have this good data set, uh, you somehow have to still ex uh, extract which pixels are good and which pi pixels are bad. Again, we just look at the fitting quality, and those pixels with bad fitting quality uh, should be removed so that this FA should be corrected like this. So the amount of rotation, motion, uh, uh, translation, uh, fitting quality, eddy current amount, and uh, the pixel rejection, all these numbers uh, do not have much meaning if you have uh, one data from, uh, 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 if you have one data. So after you finish your research with, say, 30 control and 30 normals, what you want to do is you read all these data into one, and uh, you pick up one of the data and monitor how much amount of motion this particular data has, and you have to compare to the population average, which is drawn by red line. And uh, so in this way, out of these uh, tens of data you collected, you can identify outliers then uh, you have a objective measure uh, to see which data is uh, more affected based on population. So this is a quality control pipeline we have been working on. And uh, the DTS Studio transformed the uh, raw diffusion weighted image into tensor data. And we have two more modules. Uh, to automatically parcelate this image uh, uh, by automatically identify currently 254 structures in the brain. So uh, this, uh, let me briefly explain this pipeline. And this is uh, similar to what Guido uh, presented. So this is an example of uh, our cerebral palsy patient population. We have, oops. 10 patients, uh, they have, all of them a spastic uh, type of the cerebral palsy. 
and red it has most, most severe motor function disability, and uh, purple has the least one. Uh, sorry, this is not ordered by the severity. And this is 254 structures identified, and uh, this shows FA and mean diffusivity, and we have a volume two for each structure. And because uh, you're supposed to have uh, age matched control uh, for each cell, for each structure, you can calculate Z score. And uh, this is a very interesting view because, uh, as Dr. Lipton uh, presented this morning, uh, in many patient population, we cannot assume uh, the pathology is homogeneous. And sure enough, you can see this 10 spastic cerebral palsy patient. The anatomical phenotype is hugely variable. And if, you, we, if we use a group-based analysis uh, by just uh, averaging them, uh, you are not sure what you're looking at because the affected regions are totally different. So uh, this kind of barcode, uh, we, use, we call it barcode, is uh, the, the way, uh, one, one of the ways to characterize anatomical phenotype, but this has meaning only when we correlate with uh, clinical phenotypes. So now uh, here's automated pipeline starting from DICOM data uh, all the way to atlas-based parcellation. And currently we are working on uh, web-based uh, data submission so that we can do everything automatically. But I, I have to uh, warn that as Guido uh, told, uh, this pipeline is not applicable if the subject has huge intensity change or a big lesion. Uh, we've been testing it with cerebral palsy patient with uh, large anatomical uh, variability, but uh, those are mostly uh, anatomical change, not the intensity change. So intensity change still remains as a, a big problem for this pipeline. And uh, we also have solution to, uh, uh, of the uh, database solution. And uh, so we, this is XNAT database, and we can attach our pipeline uh, into the database so that you can directly trigger the pipeline as soon as the data arrives at the database. So once we could uh, identify uh, 254 structures, instead of doing manual fiber tra tracing, uh, you can combine those uh, defined structures to automatically uh, uh, generate the fiber tracking. Uh, this pipeline uh, hasn't been implemented. Uh, this, uh, we have to use a separate IDL code uh, to do this part. But uh, the key is the, the separate uh, ROI list uh, telling in this case, for corticospinal tract, which parcel has to be combined for? So for about 50 tracts, we have this uh, list uh, telling uh, which uh, ROI has to be combined for which uh, fibers. So for, for my, this is my final slide uh, about the tractography. It has been shown that the deterministic approach tractography can uh, reconstruct only a small portion of the fiber. For example, for the motor uh, corticospinal tract, uh, the lateral part is uh, missing. This is because uh, people believe uh, uh, cross because of crossing fiber and, and uh, the deterministic approach cannot connect these red box cells even though we know that they have to be connected because uh, it stops here. Uh, this is a, uh, one of the new tractography approach which is now implemented in DTS Studio. In, in, in this case, uh, we force to connect these two red box cells and do the energy minimization to uh, estimate the most probable, probable path. Okay, so I just briefly go over uh, the new uh, tools that are now being implemented in DTS Studio. And uh, if you're interested in, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you.